Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on teaching chemical engineering with MATLAB, Simulink and TC Lab. My name is Aycan Hacıoğlu. Uh, I'm a customer success engineer at MATWORKS. And this uh, webinar is very dear and near to my heart because before joining MATWORKS, uh, I was a chemical engineering faculty. And today I'm also joined by uh, Samit Rao, our chemical and petroleum uh, industry marketing manager. And Dr. John Hedengran from uh, Brigham Young University. Uh, Dr. John Hedengran, uh, we will talk about the Kirkle modules he developed uh, using MATLAB and Simulink and TC Lab to teach process control. And he will uh, uh, talk about the, the, those modules today. So I see from the polls that actually many of you are. Uh, uh, you using uh, my MATLAB to, to some extent. But for those that might be new to MATLAB, MATLAB is a high level technical computing language. You can use MATLAB for general purpose pro programming, uh, such as algorithm development, data analysis and visualization, numeric and symbolic computations. But with the add-on tools, you can also do specialized tasks such as machine learning, deep learning, image processing, signal processing, and so on. And Simulink is another core product that MathWorks has developed. Simulink allows you to represent uh, dynamic systems as graphical and functional uh, blocks. And it's a model-based design tool. You, you can design your systems, simulate them, and test them. And it really helps you uh, going from software to hardware work. These tools are used widely in industry and in academia. Since with these specialized uh, tools, you can do your tasks very easily and quickly. It's a preferred tool by many engineers and scientists uh, across industry and uh, academia. So today we will talk about integrating computational thinking to chemical engineering curriculum. When I'm having conversations with, with faculty, I get many questions about how to introduce computation, when to introduce computation, or how they can make sure that students retain this knowledge, because usually programming is introduced in the early years of curriculum, but if it's not reinforced, by the time students graduate, they forget about what they have learned. And another thing is students want to learn um, no knowledge that they can apply when they join workforce. They, they, they want to learn something that is really useful to them. And instructors want to prepare them well for uh, the, the, their future careers in, in the workforce. So today we will talk a little bit about how MATLAB is used in industry, especially for process control applications, so that you can get a sense of how your students might be using our tools when they join workforce. And when you're integrating uh, MATLAB or Simulink to your curriculum, if you need any help, we're always here to help you. We will talk a little bit about how you can get help from us or from the resource on our website as well. So to introduce my, my MATLAB to a busy chemical engineering curriculum might be uh, challenging because so some courses in chemical engineering are not uh, programming courses, and there's a lot of subjects that you, you want to cover. So you might be wondering how you can make time to introduce computation on top of all the other topics that you want to cover. To help you with that, we develop many self-paced uh, courses. Using these self-paced courses, you don't have to spend your classroom time teaching in computation. You, you can assign your students these self-paced online courses and that they can retrieve the, their certificate of completion or progress report and that they can have a baseline when they come to your course. In that way, you can focus more on the applications or more complex problems and wouldn't have to spend your classroom time. And many of those uh, self-paced courses are uh, freely available. You don't even need to have a MATLAB license to take those courses, or you don't need to have MATLAB installed on your computers. That they're accessible via uh, a web browser. And when students are taking these courses, they will be writing actual MATLAB code. So that will prepare them 
useful for uh, your courses and for any computational tasks that, that they, they have to go through. And so some of these courses include uh, MATLAB on-ramp, Simulink on-ramp. There are also more specialized courses like machine learning, deep learning courses. And we, ho we also have longer uh, courses on computational math or uh, some foundational courses so that you can supplement your, your uh, te teaching fee with uh, these resources. And for once you introduce my MATLAB to your courses, uh, you you can so solve so many many different problems. But another question I get from from instructors is how they can into ease students into programming, because many students have uh, some programming fear when they start programming. Using MATLAB, you can overcome that fear very easily because in MATLAB the, the, there are some apps. Uh, those are co uh, graphical user interfaces. And these apps let you uh, uh, co complete many different tasks uh, by following coin point and click workflows. And you can automatically generate code out of the, the, these apps so that you can see uh, one on one uh, matching of how interactive workflows might match to the code. And if you can't find an app that you're looking for, there is another app called App Designer that helps you build your own apps. Using uh, drag and drop workflows, you can create professional looking apps and you can create interactive lecture material for your students. And you can package those apps as uh, MATLAB apps or standalone executables or web apps. And that's exactly what, what professors at Lund University did. They created some web apps to teach reaction kinetics to their students. And another way to keep your students engaged uh, during these programming courses is through uh, live editor. You can create MATLAB live scripts. These live scripts consist of code, output of the code. Uh, you can add equations, images, interactive uh, controls and tasks. And you can create a nicely organized uh, easy to follow engaging lecture material for your students and students can experience a uh, more active learning through interactions with these uh, live scripts and the doctor head and grand will also show us today uh, some live scripts that he developed for teaching controls another challenge instructors face when they introduce compu computing to their courses is how much time it will take to grade all those programming assignments. With MATLAB, great, uh, MATLAB assignments, you don't have to worry about this piece a lot because we developed an automated grading tool called MATLAB Grader. Using MATLAB Grader, you can give your students instant feedback. And when they see those uh, check marks in MATLAB Grader, that actually gamifies learning and they get very excited and motiva motivated to uh, learn more. And with MATLAB Grader, you can create your own problems or you can get started with our uh, problem collections. And some of those problem collections, uh, such as introduction to programming and numerical methods, are relevant for chemical engineers as well. And they provide uh, more room for practice for students. So after you introduce computational thinking to your students, how will you make sure that they, they remember that and uh, apply that in the, their other courses? Well, there are many courses in chemical engineering where you can utilize MATLAB and you can reinforce computational thinking throughout curriculum. Uh, such courses include reaction kinetics, fluid dynamics, process design, and heat transfer. And this list can be expanded even further. For these courses, we, we already have some existing examples on file exchange or in our documentation that are ready to use. And Dr. Hedegram will uh, talk about resources he developed for process control. But if you don't see a course that you're teaching over here, or if you want to integrate MATLAB to 
another course, you can always reach out to us. We are happy to point you to relevant resources or help you come up with lecture material for your own course. And what I would say is, as long as there is room for computation in your course, probably there is room for MATLAB or Simulink. And I also get questions from many instructors about uh, how to integrate data science to chemical engineering courses. That became uh, very popular nowadays. And Dr. Muller from Imperial College gave an excellent talk at MATLAB Expo on how he integrated machine learning to uh, his freshman course using MATLAB. If you want to learn more, more about uh, his course and uh, take a look at his material, you can visit uh, our website and watch this Expo talk. And you can also visit Teaching Data Science with MATLAB page to get more resources to integrate uh, MATLAB to your uh, MATLAB with uh, machine learning to or deep learning to your, your courses. With that, uh, I would like to leave the floor to Summit to talk about industry applications of our tools in chemical processing industries, especially on process control applications. Yes, uh, thank you, Ajahn. Uh, so like you all know, the ultimate aim of learning these concepts in university is to successfully apply them in industry. And uh, there are multiple case studies from our customers where applying these concepts have, have yielded significant benefits and unlocked value. So let us look at a few of these examples from process control. So Tata Steel is one of the world's largest steel manufacturers. The issue they were facing is that the cooling tower associated with their biggest blast furnace was inefficient. So they applied uh, model predictive control and uh, were able to compensate for the changing weather conditions. This way they were able to save tens of thousands of dollars every year along with making a meaningful reduction in their uh, carbon emissions. Another example comes from um, another steel company, which was able to bring the acidity of uh, their effluent water stream to an acceptable level by developing control algorithms and deploying it on their PLCs on the, on the DCS. Uh, using MATLAB and Simulink, they were able to uh, develop the control strategy and develop and deploy it in just three months, which is uh, uh, rather short for an industrial project. Uh, and then the uh, acceptable pH levels, like you can see, they rose to 100% from uh, the variable of um, uh, 84%. And this example is from the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry, where Genentech had um, a bioreactor, a pilot plant bioreactor. Uh, they developed control algorithms that monitored these um, bioreactor sensors, uh, such as pH, dissolved oxygen levels, and other uh, environmental conditions. The control controller took those inputs and outputted the optimal nutrient flow rates, and uh, they deployed this also as well on in the plant. Uh, using that, they were able to. Uh, cut the develop algorithm development time from months to weeks using uh, MATLAB and Simulink. We are aware that you know several customers in industry use other commercial packages for process simulation. A popular one is uh, Aspen Plus, uh, and you know keeping that in mind, we worked with them to develop uh, extension called Aspen Plus Control Design Interface, which generates a linearized state space model from uh, a process model that you've developed in um, Aspen Plus. So you can take your uh, rigorous nonlinear model, plant model that you developed in Aspen Plus, and uh, export that to Simulink and have it have and work with it just within uh, within Simulink, like it is just another Simulink block. Uh, same thing with GProms. Uh, you can use GProms for developing your process model, and you can uh, use MATLAB and Simulink for data analysis, post processing, or control algorithms. Uh, an example of that application comes from a gasification plant in the US, which had issues controlling emissions. Uh, rather than upgrade hardware, they decided to implement better control algorithms. Uh, so what they did was they built a rigorous plant model within Aspen Plus, 
exported that to Aspen plus Dynamics, where they added simple PID loops. And then they exported that to MATLAB and Simulink using the Aspen plus control design interface. Uh, once they brought it into Simulink, they were able to implement uh, plant-wide MPC strategies. Uh, so by implementing control strategies, this saved them um, a lot of money and you know, a lot of trouble without, without having to purchase expensive equipment, essentially a software upgrade on the plant. Uh, so apart from de developed control strategies, most process plants have hundreds of process control loops, and it is well known that um, loop behavior deteriorates with time. Monitoring these is a very manual task, and uh, Tupras, which is a Turkish refining company, developed uh, innovative software in MATLAB to A, diagnose the controller problems, and B, give the optimal tuning values for the loops. Uh, so I strongly recommend watching the whole talk for this. It's they saved, uh, uh, like you can see, 12 to 20 million dollars, an estimated, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, this was of course annual savings. Apart from that, they were also sa able to save hundreds of uh, engineers hours by automating this extremely manual task. Yep. So I'd like to end my portion of the talk today by requesting the educators and uh, students in the audience to look at and sign up for the capstone project on monitoring a bioreactor. I have uh, spoken with um, uh, leading pharmaceutical manufacturing companies in this space who uh, mentioned scaling up the vaccine. The COVID vaccine uh, manufacturing is a major issue. Uh, and this capstone project was inspired by their challenges. By working on this project, uh, you get exposed to a real industrial challenge while working on MATLAB and Simulink that uh, industry professionals use. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it back to Aijan. Thank you very much, Samit. Uh, it was awesome to see all those user stories from, from many different companies. And especially the Tuprash one was very near and dear to my heart because I did my internship over there when I was a chemical engineering student. And it was awesome to see MATLAB in action over there. With that, I, I would like to talk, talk a little bit about the resources available to you and how you can get a uh, help from our website and from ourselves when you're integrating computational thinking to chemical engineering curriculum. Well, first of all, we have a dedicated site for, for academia. On this page, you'll find many resources for teaching and research, especially the curriculum material uh, showcased in this website is curated and they, they're ready to use. You can also visit uh, MATLAB Help Center. You, you can use several keywords to uh, filter out different resources for yourself. For example, you can uh, search for resources for chemical engineering by typing chemical engineering to search bar, and you'll find many uh, examples or relevant documentation and so on. Lastly, uh, not lastly, also uh, by using MATLAB, you, you'll be part of a large user community. You can interact with this huge user community through MATLAB Central. You can ask questions, answer questions, and share your knowledge. And you can always reach out to customer success team. I'm part of this team, and customer success team consists of customer success engineers and customer success specialists. Customer success engineers would help you in integrating MathWorks tools to your courses or research, and customer success specialists uh, spread the word uh, about our tools and resources. They ge generate awareness ab about our tools. And you might be wondering how you can stay connected with us. One way to stay connected is attending our other webinars. You can visit our uh, event site to see upcoming events and join them. We have a variety of uh, webinars and events throughout the year on many different topics. And if you're also planning on participating in 2021 AICHE annual meeting, we will be presenting four talks over there. And Dr. Heather Gran is part of uh, one of those talks, and we would love to see you uh, join our talks at AICHE meeting as well. We gathered some resources for you for several chemical engineering courses over here. Uh, th these resources are some documentation examples, some product pages. 
But if you need any further resources or if you would like to discuss another course that you are teaching, you can always reach out to us. We are happy to help you integrate uh, MathWorks tools to your courses as well as your research. With that, uh, I would like to thank you and I would like to hand over to that Dr. John Hedengren for his excellent talk uh, about integrating MATLAB and summoning to process control courses with TC Labs. Oh, thank you, John, and thank you, Sambith. Uh, great overviews and, and certainly impressive, all the case studies. You know, spending, um, you know, seven years in industry working with ExxonMobil and others, you see the, you know, the, the potential, the power of, of some of these Industry 4.0 initiatives. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen now, uh, and I looked through the attendee list as well. I was very pleased to see several, uh, many on the attendee list that I know either from online communications or uh, in person as well. So welcome, glad that you're able to join. And I hope to make this as interactive as possible uh, today. I'd like to also acknowledge the support of Joshua Hammond, who's on the call today as well. He's a research assistant that took on this fairly substantial project of developing these course modules with a team of his own. And so over the last year, he's worked uh, quite a bit uh, to do that. He's going to be starting as a graduate student at UT Austin, uh, my alma mater. So um, glad that he's uh, 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 on that journey as well. Uh, let me uh, just get started with um, some some also appreciation for all the response that we got on LinkedIn about a week ago. I shared this and uh, about 20,000 uh, views and, uh, you know, many, um, you can see that some of the stats of, of who was interested in some of this and, and some of the companies as well. These are some of the analytics that come from LinkedIn. Uh, so many from oil and gas industries is interesting. I've seen that, you know, many are perhaps trying to retool uh, this time and and uh, and and look in other industries, uh, maybe the oil and gas industry, uh, and transitioning to others. Or you see many uh, students, professors, research fellows, and others. And then here are some of the locations uh, where people viewed that. Okay, uh, today I want to talk a little bit about automation needs across the industries. A little bit about these. Uh, 35 lesson modules and how you might be able to use these in your course or if you're self-study, if you're a, a student, how you might be able to pick some of these up and, and develop some of these skills. I'll talk about this pocket size lab and some of the MATLAB Simulink and live script demos. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed uh, working with over the last little bit are some of these live scripts make very interactive modules for students and also for teaching. And then also share some other collaborative community resources. I was uh, the new chair of the uh, uh, the Control System Society, the IEEE Control System Society um, Technical Committee on Education. Uh, and so we're collaborating and, and developing some of these resources as well. Okay, so automation impact across the industry. Uh, next time you get an operation done, it might be done by a robot, uh, maybe with more precision and control, people transportation as well, some of the self-driving cars. We've seen some of the recent news about uh, government uh, probing some of the mistakes, uh, but you know, maybe the self-driving cars are safer, maybe they'll become safer than people eventually, even though they're not perfect. You look at product transportation as well, how we buy things and how those things are delivered as well, are is going to be changing uh, in the next couple of years. We look also at traditional industries like the oil and gas industry with some of the new topics that are of high interest, such as data science, analytics, machine learning, cybersecurity, and digitalization. So. Let me talk about the control course that I teach, and I'd love to get your thoughts. If you have comments on how you teach uh, the course, or also if there are particular modules that uh, might be missing uh, from 
from this. Uh, we've tried to develop modules around each of these. And I'll give a little bit of our philosophy on each of these blocks and, and how this all fits together and how we how we take a student from controller design where they're thinking about the application and what they want to accomplish to identify things like the output PV set point. You know, if they don't have data, then some of the things that Sam Booth and Ijon mentioned about some of the simulators or others where we use physics-based models and linearize those, or we simulate the data and then come back to step tests and do either graphical fits or regression. And then we develop models, simple mathematical models of our process as like digital twins of the process in a simplified way. They give us the opportunity to say, OK, do I have measured disturbance? If yes, I'll decide a feed for a cascade controller. If not, I'll decide if it's an integrating system. If it is, then I might only need a P only controller. If not, I could use an integral or derivative action as well. In the course, we also look at stability analysis um, with some of our limits. How far can we drive the gain? How much performance can we get out of this system before it goes unstable? Then we use tuning correlations to convert the simplified process models like a first sort plus dead time into PID tuning parameters and then go through this additional loop of controller performance, monitoring and tuning. So for each of these blocks in this course, we've developed some modules that have theory, simulation, and then a lab. And then we repeat that again. We cover the theory, the equations, the fundamentals. We have the student simulate, and then we give them the TC lab to work with real data and work with these modules uh, interactively through live scripts, simulate modules, or MATLAB scripts. And if you'd like to go to the course, I've got this um, the course schedule here. You can pull that up and then on each of these next to the MATLAB symbol, you'll see the uh, live scripts that are there. There's also a GitHub archive. And if you go down, you'll see the schedule uh, with each of the modules listed with the theory, simulation, and then lab exercise for each of those. So these are a total of uh, at least 40, but they're actually 35 with some of the exams. Um, and then some additional resources. You can also download that from the MATLAB online. OK, so th that's where you can find all of this development. You're welcome to use it, modify it, republish it however you'd like. Uh, it's listed under the MIT license, so open source and freely available. Now, let's talk about teaching process control from the instructor perspective. OK, so you have maybe uh, something that you're trying to teach the students about process dynamics and control, and then you want to give them a laboratory experiment. Uh, these are often found in a unit operations lab. They're typically uh, accompany the teaching material and the students schedule time to come in and work with the lab, maybe one after the other or in small groups. There's also this the new TC lab modules allow you to instead of assigning a single piece of process control equipment, you can give one of these to each student. They can take it home and learn it or with in-class uh, activities that you can do as you're teaching the materials. So you can say, let's do a step test, and then they all do a step test with the module and, and collect their own data. So I also want to talk about the student. So I've highlighted one student in blue here. So let's just look at the course from their perspective. OK, so in, in the first case, if they're scheduling time on this piece of equipment, they're only going to have a fraction of the time divided by the number of students or the number of groups to be able to work with this. Also, they need to schedule time to come in. Uh, they don't really, maybe like once or twice during the semester, they can do something like that. Versus if they bring their lab home and they can work with it, uh, then they can do it at their own pace. Uh, they have the time to work with it, maybe on each assignment or more frequently throughout the semester. 
But one of the things we've seen as well from students is, you know, maybe they took a freshman or sophomore programming class, but they may have forgotten a lot of things about programming. They might, half of the students might feel intimidated uh, by the course. And Samvith and I, John mentioned, there are many great MathWorks resources that help them get onto the on-ramp and uh, really refresh some of their memory about programming. We have these additional 12 modules designed for about two to three hours to do a quick crash course on MATLAB, in particular with the TC lab generating their own data, but everything from debugging variables, printing, how to work with the Arduino, functions, loops, input, if statements, arrays, cell arrays, and then plotting. So just the basic things they need to really, if you think uh, liken this to a trip, it's like getting off the ground. Um, feeling like you're starting to gain altitude. Uh, you're putting in a lot of effort initially, but you're you know, just going down the runway. You got to get a kind of a critical background or speed uh, to really take off in this course. And then beyond that, they really start to gain this elevation as they go through this cycle of learning theory, doing simulations, interactive modules to give them intuition about the concepts, and then applying it to data. Okay, so that's the second part of the course. And these are all of the modules that we mentioned. We'll go through just two of these out of the 35. Uh, so they'll they'll do theory, simulation, practice with their own device and with data. Okay, so we, as we look at this course map, um, we also on landing, I think this is part of the synthesis, then synthesizing as part of the course is to have them also do a project with this lab. So a little bit more open-ended that gives them the big picture. We've identified each of these individual blocks and how they're going through them, but at some point you wanna give them a project and say, okay, here's a controller, uh, see if you can have good control performance. And so they go through this themselves, the whole thing. Um, so instead of just one block at a time, they're going through the entire map. All right, so let's talk just a little bit more about this. I've given many other webinars and presentations on this, but for those that aren't familiar with this, we have a temperature sensor. There are actually two of them, and they're these little uh, thermistors, and then they're attached to some heaters on this side. So the heater level is listed here between zero and 100%. And then you can see a set point. We have a target set point for the temperature and the measured value is in orange. So this comes from this value, the heater we can adjust through MATLAB or Simulink or the live scripts um, with a plug and play device. So this just gives an overview of the two temperature sensors and two heaters. And we can also uh, what simplified commands so that a student doesn't get lost in the programming. So this is the, these are the commands to connect. You connect uh, to the lab that automatically loads any firmware needed as well. And then this is the command to turn on the LED to 80%. So flash this one right here to 80%. And then we can display the first temperature and adjust the heater to 50%. So very simple commands to be able to control this. And then if you have two heaters instead and two temperature sensors, then it's likewise uh, fairly simple to just add uh, a disturbance, for example. Q2 could be a disturbance, or you could have multivariate control, except, uh, for example. Okay, but let's start from the beginning. Uh, and I just want to review this very first one, which is the step test. So you have a process and you have a controller output that you're gonna run in manual. And you wanna just be able to step that, uh, you know, to uh, step the heater value, turn it on to a certain level, and then observe the temperature response. Okay, and then they can do things like calculate gain time constant and dead time from that. So let's just go on here. I'm gonna show how to build this in Simulink just from the ground up, from the raw signals that come from the Arduino. Okay, and then once they start this, then they can do the step test. 
So this becomes the physical lab right here. And then you can see the Q1 and the Q2, those are your two heaters. And then temperature one and temperature two, those are shown right here. And I've turned the heater on to 53%. And what we should see here is that temperature two should stay about constant. It might rise just a little bit as it feels some of the effect from the other heater that's next to it. But this is temperature one right here. And this one should come up and then level out at a, a certain point. You can also see bad data here as well. So measurement noise. Uh, and, and so this is very realistic for the students. They, you know, maybe only done simulations in the past. And so they might have a fundamental model just from an energy balance that predicted this. And uh, maybe the model is doing something else. And so this is a very, inter you know, for many students, it's a very interesting exercise because they, they can understand try to uh, dig down deeper what is the the difference between these two okay so i want to talk about some of the other modules as well we have this fopdt uh you know graphical fit and this allows us to use live scripts to give them some interactive modules so this is an example of the live script and uh you can view the lecture material right there with the solution guide. It's a video that Joshua has created. And then you have the gain. So as they adjust this slider bar back and forth, uh, you'll see that uh, the model changes. OK, so the FOPDT model here, and they've previously collected their data. So they want these two to fit as best they can. And so they're going to drag these back and forth and adjust them until they get it to align best they can. Then later we'll do regression to, to make that happen. But it gives them more of an intuitive understanding about what's happening with these parameters. All right, and then we're going to go on to another module. It's just another example. This one's going to be the Tune APID controller. Um, all right, so uh, this is going to be the next step where we do this in simulation. They can adjust their PID parameters here. And uh, so after they do this, they want to get a good performance out of their controller. Maybe they use IMC or ITAE or other types of tuning rules to come up with initial values. And then, uh, and then they're going to try it out with uh, the device as well all from this live script. Okay, so they tune it in simulation. And then we'll go down uh, here. If they get stuck at all, you'll see this view solution right here, where they can select that and then some code help will appear if they get stuck. Now I've connected it to the TC lab. We've sped it up 12 times just so it's a little bit faster, but these are in seconds right here so you saw the performance up above what we expected and then we collect data down below from our physical device and all of this is done from the live script uh, so they're able to simulate and then collect the data and it makes it uh, more interactive for them okay so we can also do this in Instead of a rebuilt module, you can also have them build a block diagram uh, directly in Simulink. So I'm just going to change this open loop into a closed loop uh, model and a block diagram. I'm going to add another port here. And I want to be able to view the set point. I'll drag my PID block in. And then also a summation block as well. Change the signs to plus and minus. So it's a feedback controller. And I'll right click that and there's my feedback control. Now I'm just gonna plot some of those signals. And so it's very similar to what they'd see in a textbook, for example, with block diagrams. But instead we have this physical device there in the middle in our Simulink block. Put in some tuning parameters, uh, change my output limits from zero to 100. 
uh, implement some anti wind up and then it's ready to go. So uh, now we're going to go ahead and simulate this or not simulate. This is uh, physical data. And then when I change the set point to 50. OK, so my set point is this yellow line and you can see the controller response. At a certain point, if the student isn't satisfied with the controller tuning, they can change it as the Simulink model is running. So you can see the controller became more aggressive with an increasing gain from 10 to 15. And then you can see uh, the output. There's the heater value, PV, and set point. So the dynamics for this are long enough. This is a five minute exercise. They're long enough that the student can respond to it and actively change it as they go. Also other modules as well, such as model predictive control. And so this is an example of a multivariate uh, control problem where you can see into the future, you can predict into the future what the move plan is going to be and what the controller's response is uh, going to do as well. There's also estimation and controls. These are more advanced control topics like moving horizon estimation. It's a type of machine learning where we go, uh, you know, as we're going, we identify the model and then uh, you predict into the future. OK, so this combines model predictive control and an estimator. And there are also data science modules as I, John and Sam Veith mentioned there are very good ones um, on the MathWorks website as well. We recently translated this one into Spanish. Uh, this also uses the TC Lab. I just want to give one example of a module here. Uh, this is like equipment monitoring, where you're monitoring the heater and to see that it's working correctly. So I'm just going to play this. The heater turns on or off and you were recording the temperature. We also use some features. Uh, now these are the derivatives of the temperature and these three features then become the input to some of our machine learning methods. Everything from logistic regression, stochastic gradient descent, K nearest neighbors, neural network. Those top eight are all um, those are supervised learning methods, and then the bottom three are unsupervised uh, learning methods or clustering methods. And so you can see here the heater turned on and it was able to learn just from these temperature signals. It said, well, your heater's on, uh, but let's say you commanded it to be on, but this said that it's actually off. Uh, then you'd say, well, the heater's broken. It's not working correctly. So you can have students unplug the heater power and then see if the machine learning can detect a faulty heater, for example. OK, so that's just another exercise. Um, I just wanted to, for all of the instructors that are here on the call, if you'd like an evaluation version of the TC Lab, please send me an email with your name, shipping address, and the course that you teach. Uh, in the US, they typically arrive in about two to three business days. International, I've had more trouble with those. Um, you know, the custom seems to be a little bit slower right now, some of the precautions they're taking. Um, but um, I'll be glad to send one of these to you. And uh, I just need your, your shipping information. There's some countries that uh, they, the packages do not arrive, um, unfortunately. Uh, India is one of those. Brazil is another. Uh, so for those cases, if you would like one, uh, please just let me know if somebody that is uh, traveling to the US, I'll ship it to them and then they can take it back to you. So it might take just a little bit longer, but packages unfortunately don't uh, arrive uh, to those locations. And then if you're uh, and you're welcome to just keep the lab and use it. Um, if you would like to use it in your course, one of the things that many instructors have done is ordered bulk from their department budget and then students check those out. Another way that uh, has been more appealing recently is just have the students uh, get the lab and it becomes like a textbook uh, fee or something like that for as part of the course and then they just keep the lab and and instructors don't have to manage those. So. There is a link here on Amazon if you'd like to give that to students uh, for them to use it um, in 
tenured course. All right, I wanted to mention also some other community teaching resources. And these are some that I've, I've worked with other faculty to develop. The ones that I maintain are here in process control and then also in computer programming. So if you have resources for those that you'd like to suggest, uh, please reach out. This is computing and chemical engineering. So it's, it's everything to do with computing and initiatives about how to introduce computing into these courses and resources and links that we share. Uh, and so if any of the courses you're teaching, even intro to chemical engineering, fluid mechanics or others, uh, just search for this and if you have uh you know, you're welcome to use those resources also if you have some of your own i'd love to be able to add those uh, to the list also another thing that we're doing with the ieee control system society this year working with brian douglas on resourcium.org and so i recommend this as well especially for those teaching process control or learning you can develop a custom journey um, you know, feature journeys, you know, learning about PID control. Brian's done a great job uh, aggregating some of these resources for things like Common Filter, PID, or others. Uh, so I recommend this site as well. All right, and then uh, finally to finish it off, I'd like to thank uh, collaborators on this to develop this community resource. Uh, Melda, uh, Samvith, and Ijon from MathWorks for the technical, but also the financial support for some of our students who develop these modules. And then Abe Martin, June Ho Park, Colin Anderson, Nathaniel Nelson for their great work, uh, in addition to Joshua Hammond who led the effort on these modules. And then uh, Jeff Cantor and Carl Sandrick, uh, Jeff at Notre Dame and Carl at University of Pretoria in South Africa uh, for some of their leading uh, guidance on developing this course and and feedback from them using it. Uh, also, others that have, uh, have translated it to other language like Paulo Mar Oliveira in Portugal uh, and and others that have adopted the course and and used it. And then John Anthony Rostier uh, and other faculty who have um, helped to publish some of the pedagogical research surrounding this lab and some of the effect that it's having on students to quantify the improvement in learning. Uh, here are some of the articles. Uh, just in the past year, here are the 2020 articles, uh, and then 2019. So you can see a number of, of articles where we have talked about uh, your experience with the class uh, and these this module. Well, thank you, Ijon, and thanks, Melda and Sanvi for hosting us as well. Um, Really appreciate this opportunity and uh, thanks everybody for joining.